Hi, glad to be with you today. Hope you're having a great holy day and letting God's love shine through you in your actions, deeds, and with the use of your money. You know, when you think about the Episcopal Church, you oftentimes think, oh, it's a church that's just dying out and full of a bunch of old people that are really undynamic and not making a difference in the world and help make the world a better place. And I want to help dispel that today because I'm lucky enough to have a really bright theologian who is instrumental in reinvigorating the Episcopal Church and spreading the Word of God through the Anglican medium. Thank you for being with me, Chris. Thank you, David. Yeah. So, uh, should I introduce myself? Yeah, tell them what you're doing. You've got a great resume of well, accomplishment. Well, thank you, brother. Yeah, so um, I am uh, Christopher Wells, and I uh, edit the Living Church magazine, and I'm the executive director of the Living Church Foundation. And, um, David, I know you wanted me to mention that, um, well, we're here in Dallas today, and the Bishop of Dallas, our friend, invited me to come down here a couple years ago and open a second office of the Living Church. Um, but we're 140 years old, and we're the oldest. Uh, we're the, we, we publish a magazine that has been in continuous publication since 1878. That is fantastic. What a great heritage. It's a great heritage. It's a great, and we're independent, um, but we're loyal to the Episcopal Church, and we also serve the whole Anglican Communion. Right, and the worldwide communion, which people think of, well, the Episcopal Church is just a tiny little dying denomination, but the Anglican communion worldwide is, a big, is growing and exploding that's and exactly doing right. the Word of God. That's exactly bringing right. Bringing people to Christ. Yeah, right. I mean, all the Christian churches are, are booming in the global south, as we say, and especially in Africa. So the Catholics are booming down there, the Pentecostals, the Anglicans as well. Um, I think as a kind of organized church or communion of churches and Christians, we're the third largest church in the world after the uh, Roman Catholics and the Orthodox. And we're old and ancient. You know, Christians have been in England since the second or third century Maybe after before Christ. That. Maybe even before then. So that's part of our heritage, which, which comes from England and the Church of England. And it's kind of a family of churches that was spread really through the, the British Empire and the Commonwealth, um, but the, the broadening and expanding of, of Anglicanism outside of England, really the first occasion of it was, was America, with the American Revolution. Right. And so we, we're an old partner of the Church of England in this country, and uh, there are great parts of our history and a lot to be proud of, amazing leaders. Lots of Episcopalians have been influential Americans. Um, Episcopalians played a great role in kind of forming the Anglican Communion in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, partly because Americans uh, sent out missionaries all throughout the world as well. Um, and then, you know, in the latter part of the 20th century, we've sometimes had our disagreements, and the Episcopal Church has, you know, become a little bit more of a progressive force in the Anglican Communion, a liberal voice, as you and I were talking about. But um, we're still in the Communion. And there still are kind of traditionally minded uh, folks in the Episcopal Church as well. And so that's right. really what, what I'm about and what the Living Church is about. We are a kind of um, traditionally minded magazine and ministry. Um, but we, uh, we stay in the Episcopal Church and we, we work with, with folks really wherever we can, just like Christians are supposed to work with one another and with, and with, uh, with everybody you know, in the world that God created, really. Well... You know, because I don't represent the national church, <laughs> I can give a, a ceaseless plug for Church of the Incarnation, which is a wonderful, traditional, very scriptural and uh, intense worship experience that I really look forward to every Sunday. And I get to see Chris there when he's not out in the world spreading the Word of God and helping yeah. people network and grow That's together. That's right. Yeah, I love to travel. and. You know the Living Church's ministry has just been kind of exploding, which has been really fun. Um, I'm in my ninth year editing the magazine now, and we, um, we're growing. The circulation is growing in a print, a print publication. Of course, Which we have, is unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable. And you've got a really dynamic web presence. We do, yeah. Uh, livingchurch.org is the website. And, um, and uh, you know, we publish a couple other things as well, and increasingly we're getting into teaching. 
um, and educational type things. And so we've recently introduced the Living Church Institute as a kind of umbrella for all the teaching things we're doing. But we're doing conferences uh, throughout the world, actually. You know, we, have, we have one coming up this June in, in um, Oxford. And I'm planning one now for 2019 in Canada. Um, and throughout the US. We haven't, we haven't taken Africa yet for a conference, but we probably will, because um, we have friends throughout the world. Um, but conferences, and, so, and I travel a lot, and speak, and teach. And I teach at several of our seminaries. So it's true, I travel a lot. But when well, I come I'm back to so Dallas. I'm so glad we could get you in today <laughs> to share the good news about what you're working on. Well, thank you, Out of your busy schedule of networking and yeah. conferencing and educating. And I think that's one of the things that you can get out of going to their website, subscribing to their magazine. I'm a huge fan of old print media, and the magazine is beautiful. It is beautiful. It's printed on wonderful paper. It's a rich theologic with discussions of scripture in each issue. That's right. Out of the common lectionary. Yep. And, uh, and practical stories, encouraging stories, encouraging uh, you know, stories of growth and you know, evangelism and uh, people you know, putting their money where their mouth is and being courageous and sacrificing. And uh, we, have, we have a great team of journalists who do kind of like old fashioned you know, research and stories, and they tell all sides, and, and they're also international. I've got two editors in England, actually. Really? Um, and we've got a whole bunch of kind of stringers. Um, what I'm looking for, actually, what part of the, we're, we're doing our first endowment campaign ever. Right, which is really exciting to really build sustainability for the next hundred years. That's right. And the business, of the, the core business of the Living Church, which is printing the magazine, and we also publish uh, the Episcopal Musician's Handbook, the business is is running great. I mean, we're, we're running in the black now. I passed my first surplus budget this year. But the endowment uh, campaign is going to fund growth of program and teaching and more conferences and discipleship and uh, gathering young leaders. That's right. actually part of our vision here in Dallas to use the space. Um, but just to say that uh, once we scale up a little bit more, once I have a little more capital, uh, it, you know, in the bank. Um, I'd love to develop more journalists in the global south because we don't have any really good correspondents right now from Africa who are African writers writing for us. And I've, I was a missionary in South Africa. I've been to East Africa. We really need um, part-time journalists in West Africa, South Africa, and East Africa. So if you're watching this show on the internet, and are moved, if you're in the Anglican Church in the Global South, which we reach through the miracle of Internet TV and our website inspiredwithdavid.com, you can check out the livingchurch.org. Of course, they are in the early stages of their endowment campaign. Would love to have your support. It's a worthy cause. I'm a supporter of the Living Church. and. Um, Chris's incredible work, and I hope that you will come to Church of the Incarnation and maybe get a chance to meet Chris one of those lucky weekends when he gets to worship with us and Absolutely. Uh, is not out doing the Lord's work in the greater world. You know, I was just going to say, David, you know, there's a, there are seasons to every, you know, different parts of seasons in our lives. Right. And I've, I've, uh, I, I, uh, I feel like the Lord is telling me to put down roots and settle. Uh, which doesn't mean I won't travel or think of myself as a missionary, and I will. But this is why I'm looking to move to Dallas. I mean, I'm, you know, hopefully going to buy a house soon. Yeah. And so then, and then I'll join Church of the Incarnation. Um, but it is, uh, I always say, you know, I wrote an editorial recently about the vision of where the Living Church is going next and the Institute and how we're growing. Um, and I described why we accepted the bishop's invitation to come to Dallas and have an office here. Right, because well, you said, originally were up in Wisconsin. Yeah, right? and we still have our, our home base in Wisconsin, which because I've got a staff up there, people from Wisconsin. But and the loyal critical and, mass of dynamic Episcopal churches is really dioceses like the Diocese of Dallas, which has got an incredibly faith-filled Well, it's true. And you I'm know, not going sure? to throw the upper Midwest under the bus. Okay, but, well. But, but, you know, we got old spiritual roots there. But, um, and Neshota House is up there. I, I teach at Neshota. Um, 
So, and we have an internet, you know, we have a, a national ministry. So there are strong, healthy churches throughout right. the country. I gotta just, say that. You're just not a native Texan. He's, <laughs> he has yet to even <laughs> pass say, the trial period gotta, of being a Texan. I'm not what sure if someone's you, watching this video from New York City and they say, who, what am I, chopped liver? Move here, Dallas, <laughs> Texas, the place to be. <laughs> well, look, brother. It's I mean, the that buckle was in the like, Bible belt. That was all preface to say, of course I got here as quick as I could. That's right. I love it here. I love the people here, I love the generosity, but the church is growing. And what I was gonna say is, I think Dallas is a spiritual hotspot. It is. It is, and, not, and a Christian hotspot, and not just for the Episcopalians. I mean, you know, I think Christianity is doing best, everybody would agree, um, there are more Christians in the South than in any other part of our country. Um, it doesn't mean there aren't problems, you know, in this part of the country, but I'd rather have those problems than like an empty church or closing yeah. my churches or consolidating dioceses. That's what we're doing in the Episcopal which, Church. Which there are struggling churches and a lot of them are in areas that are losing population. It's true. Yeah, Dallas, 200 people move to Dallas a day. Maybe more than that. Yeah, that's what I've heard. To the Metroplex. I mean, yeah. it's crazy how many yeah. people are coming in. Yeah. And, you know, the Episcopal Church is growing, planting new churches in these growing areas. Yep, it's We great. were just, just talking about this exciting new church planning rejuvenation going on down in South Dallas. Yeah. Which as you know, South Dallas is a passion of mine, transforming, as we say, transformation is happening, change is happening, and we're making a real difference. The Greater Dallas Coalition, which I talk about a lot because I'm so passionate about it, is having superb results. We had a fantastic monthly coalition meeting. I would really encourage you to go to the website, Find out when our next coalition meeting is and come down to South Dallas and see people that are really making a difference, doing great things. Of course, we need to broaden our support. I'm a really big supporter and we need more broad support. So any donation of any size is more than welcome. You can go to our website and make a donation. The Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, that dynamic growing Episcopal Diocese is a great supporter of the Greater Dallas Coalition and is one of our largest donors, which, you know, one of the characteristics of the Episcopal Church is it really does an awful lot of charitable work out Absolutely. in the world as a portion Part of, of its, history too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, evangelism and making the world a better place and operating seminaries and doing yeah. so much to yep. continue the heritage of Christianity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Episcopalians are playing a real important leadership role here in Dallas, and but but in a cooperative ecumenical kind of way, like you're saying. Our colleague, uh, Carrie Born Headington, who I know you've had on this show a couple times, um, is of course an evangelist for the Episcopal Diocese of Dallas. And a good one. And she's a great one. And she's a great preacher, she's charismatic. She's also a networker and she's worked with a kind of ecumenical network here in Dallas, including with um, black churches, black pastors. Well, that's why Baptists. she's so passionate about the Greater Dallas Coalition. Exactly. Because it's a non-denominational umbrella yep. of both churches and charitable activities operating under Christ's mandate yep. to love our neighbors ourselves and really make a difference. I gotta tell you something, David. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but I was just mentioning the, another person you got to have on this show is my friend Matt Burdett. I'm Father, looking forward to it. The Reverend Dr. Matt Burdett. He's a newly ordained priest, uh, African American, with a PhD in theology. Awesome. Dear friend of mine. He writes for the Living Church. He's smart. He's exactly the kind of bright young leader that I like to collect for what, what we're doing. So exciting. And he and his wife moved to Dallas. I, I encouraged them to come last year. I introduced him to Bishop Sumner. They found a job for him. And he's at the Episcopal Church of, of the Good Shepherd on the north side. But at the diocese's encouragement, they've partnered with Our Savior Church in South Dallas, which is an old kind of declined Episcopal Church. They have like 12 people on a Sunday. But they have an amazing garden um, that, that grows vegetables and feeds the neighborhood. And Matt has come up with the most innovative uh, project. Now they're, gonna, they're hoping to start a Episcopal school for children in the neighborhood, and by this process, actually renew the parish. Yeah. Um, and so it's really, really exciting. But I think that's an example of Christian cooperation, ministry, service of the poor, 
racial reconciliation, uh, Christian teaching, and leadership development, and thinking about the future, the need for young leaders. Um, so I just think it's, it's precisely that kind of creative networking um, that makes Dallas such a kind of hub of spiritual energy and creativity, I think. Yeah, well, and the beautiful thing about the Episcopal Church is by having a central diocese, by having a bishop over this large family of churches, That's right. he can encourage the affluent, more successful churches to take on the project That's of right. rejuvenating a declining church in South Dallas where the number of Episcopalians has shrunk dramatically, right. but can grow with the vitality of a new young priest coming in yeah, that's right. and reinvigorating the parish. Yeah. And, um, and also probably bringing spiritual renewal, we can hope, you know, in some ways for Good Shepherd. Because, of course, in the body of Christ, we all need one another. Yeah. You know, and St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 about, you know, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, and so forth. And that the members that seem to be weaker, uh, we actually honor more. So there's that really interesting notion of, of, uh, of course, the way that the weak and the strong are kind of, kind of turned on its head by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the thesis of St. Paul in, in, in the letter of 1 Corinthians at the very beginning. What, what is God's wisdom seems like foolishness to the world, but, but to us it's the hope and the power of, of God, the wisdom and the power of God in, in Jesus Christ. Well, that's really exciting news. And, you know, the Living Church is doing so much great work out in the world with, you know, publishing this successful, lovely magazine, print magazine that goes to many people, having the dynamic web presence with a blog that's very well received and widely used. The blog is, David, if I may say, it's called Covenant. Um, and you can find that linked from the livingchurch.org as well. And it's, it's really the Anglican blog in the, in the world. I mean, it's, we get so much traffic. We've kind of taken the Anglican communion by storm, and we have lots of ecumenical readers as well. Um, so I think we have more likes on Facebook than any institution in the communion except maybe the Archbishop of Canterbury's page. Fantastic. So that means that we have quite a sort of bully pulpit and a responsibility to teach and be serious, but that's really where I'm pushing out some of the most cutting edge, deep theology and spirituality. And it's mostly being written by young leaders in our I church. I know, the exciting thing is when people think about priests, they think of somebody who's in their 50s or 60s, <laughs> kind of almost geriatric, into their career. But the exciting thing, and it's really true in the Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, is that we have a lot of young, dynamic priests, just like the young African-American PhD priest, just ordained. That's right. Fresh, full of vigor, yep. ready to do the Lord's work. Yep. And, and part uh, of why he wanted to come here is he wanted to be part of the team, you know, because it's fun to be part of a dynamic team. Well, and you act like you're really grown up, and of course, you're with your incredible, <laughs> you know, education and one thing or another, you know, you might think, oh, Chris is a member of the old generation, but to me, being a little older, he's a young guy still well, in right. the prime of his activity. And well, and the Lord little... might still call me to marriage. Yeah. You well, know? And then I would maybe, you know, I'm, I'm a little late, but oh, it's no. not too late maybe to start a family still, if that's in the Lord's plan. And that's part of why the Lord maybe called me to Dallas as well. Yeah. I feel like the Holy Spirit well, wanted me to... Dallas is a family-oriented right town. It's true. And, it's true. Uh, yeah. We need to raise up some good new acolytes. And uh, that's right, church members, and yes. uh, spread that theology. You know, we talked about before the show how Christianity is only one generation deep. There is no long-term succession plan without bringing the next generation in. Yeah, that's so interesting. To the isn't flock it? and bringing in a new generation of priests. The exciting thing is we're bringing in a new generation of priests that are ardent followers of Jesus Christ. Many of the priests of the 60s and 70s became more interested in social humanism than in the incredibly important work of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection, which we celebrated at Easter, and we're plowing right through the Easter season, getting ready to come up to the exciting day of Pentecost when the church was born Amen. in reality. Yeah, and the, so, uh, and the ascension. Yeah. Yeah, we'll celebrate the Christ Ascension in a couple weeks. Uh, 
as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. That's really an interesting point. You know, I, the more I studied uh, the Christian faith, I, I studied theology in grad school and got my PhD at a Catholic university. Um, and, you know, you read old books. I mean, one of the principles of Christian orthodoxy and kind of the apostolic faith is actually that you don't make the faith up again every generation, right? It's the old faith. It's the right. Catholic and apostolic faith. But there's a paradox, which is it's not that you can kind of write up the faith once, put it on a shelf, and then it somehow magically propagates itself. It's got to be implanted in people's hearts. It has to be taught and has to be believed. And we need to go and, you know, like Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel, go preaching to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, you know, and the baptismal creed, which is the Apostles' Creed, uh, is in the first person. That's the one that says, I believe. So on Sunday morning, when the whole community is together, in our tradition, we say the Apostles, we say the Nicene Creed, which is, we believe. We believe. Which is great also. But it's a significant point that every Christian has to be able to say, I believe, as right. well, and have faith. And we baptize infants in the, in the Catholic tradition and in the Anglican tradition, but we also have confirmation. Yes. And we believe that the grace of infant baptism means something, and the sponsors and the parents make pledges on behalf of the right, child. to raise the child in the Christian faith. Right, which also are personal pledges. They're saying, I will do this. I, as a parent, I'm not going to just like wave at a book on a shelf. I will teach it, and I, I will speak out of my own faith in a plausible and compelling way. Well, an infant that has baptism is about that grace is given, not earned. Yeah. You yeah, know, right. in terms of there's not a lot of things you have to do to receive God's grace. You don't have to go through an educational process. Right. God's grace is here That's for right. us all. It's not about head knowledge. But, but you know, but I head mean, knowledge all of, is great. But all of the New Testament does say we need faith, you know. And Aquinas, I wrote my dissertation on on Aquinas, the great um, 13th century theologian. But he said, you know, there's no essential part of the faith that couldn't be known by an illiterate old woman. He has a, a line. Um, so it's not about being all fancy pants with your education, but it is about getting across the essentials of the faith, which are basically in the creed, right. and, and being able to say that with authenticity and to believe in God and pray. That, but that is interesting, isn't it? That our work is never done, really, as long as the Lord tarries and we have new children right. and new generations, we have to teach the faith and, and, and evangelize those who haven't heard. Well, and it's important not to live your life like the second coming is tomorrow because we, none of us know the time or the place. That's right. All we can do is carry on doing the Lord's work, spreading the Lord's word, spreading the good news, with the expectation that the second coming is a long way away. Now, many people say, oh, the second coming may be just happening tomorrow. Sure. The world is in such disarray. People have been always saying that, and it's sure. important to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. The worst is you die tomorrow, so you need to have your faith in order. You need to ask Jesus to be your Savior in your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till tomorrow because you may not have tomorrow coming, but don't plan your life like you don't have tomorrow coming. Yeah, that's right. Gotta, that's interesting. You got to live both ways. The both end. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's the interesting sort of theme in scripture about, you know, you know, sleeper awake, you know, and and don't don't be asleep when the Lord comes. <laughs> right. So, there's always a piece of me that thinks, golly, you know, I'm going to bed. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I hope the Lord doesn't come in the middle of the night or blame me, you know. But of course, there's a paradox there because I mean, the spiritual truth, you know, St. Paul says too, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians, you know, about pray unceasingly. Yeah. I've thought a lot about that. You know, what could that mean? I mean, obviously, if you were just praying constantly the whole time talking to God, you would never go to work. And you wouldn't get you anything would done. You wouldn't share right. God's love in the world. But I think the point is to cultivate a spirit of prayer. And the more that I've grown as a Christian with daily prayer and praying the daily office and reading scripture every day, it's the power of the Lord's prayer saying, thy will be done. Isn't the Lord's Prayer is so incredibly powerful. The Lord's powerful. Prayer is amazing. And it's in the Bible. Yeah. Jesus it's said, scripture. the disciples say, teach us how to pray. And he says, pray like this. So it's right from God's mouth. Pray yeah. like this, our Father. Um, and of course, in the Christian tradition, I mean, in the long Christian tradition, 
people will pray the Lord's Prayer multiple times a day. It's, you know, you pray it in the morning. I pray it right when I wake up, before I get out of bed. I claim the day for God, and I give my life to God. And it's the radicality of thy will be done. When you yeah. really think about that, it's exactly what Jesus said in Gethsemane to the Father. Um, not my will, but thine be done. Yeah. And what in effect you're saying is, my life is not my business. I'm giving my life to you. You make of it what you want, Lord. I'm your instrument. And right. that, I think it's when we get in that spirit that we're praying unceasingly. Then our lives become a prayer. Our whole lives become a sacrifice and an offering back to God. Yeah. Well, the Lord's Prayer is so powerful, and I'm so happy it's a part of the worship in the Episcopal Church yeah. that emphasizes it. We do intercessory prayer, praying for the needs of others and whatnot, but the Lord's Prayer is a central part of the communion part of the service. Well, we say it in every single office of the church, actually. It's in morning and evening prayer, it's in Compline, it's in noonday prayer. Every single liturgy that our church offers has the Lord's Prayer in it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what's so good is that it is really a giving prayer yeah. as yeah. opposed to a getting prayer. Yep, it's, it's a forgiving prayer as well. Yes, forgive us our trespasses, yeah. we forgive those who trespass against yes. us. Yes. Such an incredibly powerful thing. Yes. We're not asking God to forgive us and we don't have to forgive others, but it's a conditional forgiveness That's right. that we agree that we're going to forgive others as so as the, we've been forgiven. We've had a really exciting show today with Christopher from the Living Church, livingchurch.org. We're just really filled with the Spirit today, and Chris is always a thought-provoking, intelligent man. Please go to their website and subscribe to the magazine. I'm a huge fan of old print magazines, and I don't want to do everything I can to keep them going and vital over 140 years in publication. Yes, Let's make it another 100. So have a great day and look forward to seeing you in church. Take care. Bye.